And welcome everyone. This is Rob Brown here, host of the Accounting Leaders Podcast. And we're here with another four very esteemed global accounting leaders today to talk about the interesting times that are going on. And uh, you can tell this is live in a way. We've got the dog going on there and we are in interesting times. And these people you have before you are very influential people in terms of overseeing accounting networks, alliances, and they've got a unique perspective on what is happening right now. So we're going to talk through a few issues. I'm going to ask all of the panelists just to introduce themselves very briefly with a bit of background and how they got to where they are so that you know who's speaking to you today. And then we're going to jump straight in. So Martin, you're my top left. Can we start with you, sir? I'm Martin Sharp, Executive Director of DFK International, an association of independent accounting firms, about 220 members, around about 90 countries around the world, and we've been in existence for coming up to 60 years. I've been in the role for 10 years, and prior to that, I had a 30-year career in the Royal Air Force, uh, operating helicopters at the tactical level, a bit of leadership at the operational level, and then quite a bit of time at Ministry of Defence, strategically dealing with international relations. So quite a move from that kind of world into one of the uh, accounting profession, but one uh, that, I, that I've enjoyed very much indeed over the last 10 years. Thank you, Martin. Great to have you with us. Graham, please give us a little intro. Hi, I'm Graham Gordon. I'm the Chief Executive and Executive Director of Praxity, uh, a group of independent accounting firms. Uh, the 63 of us, the uh, 63 firms, 110 uh, countries, uh, I've been in this role for uh, just over 12 years now, um, and before that, I, I, I am a qualified accountant, but before I became a qualified accountant, I was a helicopter pilot in the Royal Navy. So, um, the senior service, as you put, rather than I, will, I respect that position. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Great to have you with us. James, have you been in the military before or are you going to be an odd one out here? We'll hear from Julio in a moment. But... Uh, uh, def definitely the odd one out as far as the military. <laughs> um, my name is James Mendelson. I'm currently a director of Global Alliance Advisory Services. Um, we work exclusively with uh, primarily accounting, but some legal networks too just providing uh, advice to them in these quite uh, challenging, but also rather exciting times in the network world. Uh, prior to that, I spent 18 years first as the CEO and then for the last five years as the chairman of MSI Global Alliance, uh, which is um, a, a global association, but different in that it has both law firms and accounting firm members, which makes it just a little bit different. Yeah. So um, that's my background. Thank you, James. And Julio from Florida today, is that correct? That's right. Sunny, Hello. sunny Miami. Okay. Uh, well. We're just getting out of quarantine, so it's good. Um, just, just in time for the beach. So uh, my name is Julio Gave. I am uh, the president and CEO of Abacus Worldwide. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me to the call, Rob. Um, Abacus Worldwide is an association of both accounting firms and law firms. Uh, that is uh, different to most most groups on on this call and most groups in general because uh, we do cater to both disciplines. We've been uh, around for about eight years. Uh, I founded the group in 2012 uh, with zero members, and today we have 70 firms around the world. We are uh, also moving uh, quite quickly towards a, a merger with uh, another group called JHI. Uh, who will be formally uh, uh, joining Abacus uh, once they finalize their process of, of voting September 1st. Uh, by that time, we will be around 125 firms uh, globally. Um, and prior to Abacus, I was uh, the executive director of a group called Polaris International. Uh, I was with that group for about 10 years. Uh, and if you know any history with these associations, which most people probably don't. Uh, I've merged Polaris International with a group called IGAF, and that created what is now known as Prime Global. Uh, so I've, I've been in the association world for quite a bit, uh, mostly on the accounting side, and for the last eight or nine years on both the accounting and legal side. Uh, so it's nice to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. It's great to have you with us, gentlemen. And uh... I'm just going to ask you straight out the gate. It, it is great that you're here collaborating. In some ways, you are in adversarial competitive situations, but this is a time. Are you talking to one another a lot? Is this a time where you're picking up the phone and 
there's a little bit of M and A activity going on, and, and associations as alliances are merging or talking about working together more collaboratively. Graham, is there a lot of collaboration now? Uh, there's two parts to your question, really. Is there a lot of M and A? No, there is some, uh, and I've seen it. Uh, and I think some are smaller firms, uh, smaller associations or alliances are finding it uh, appropriate to merge, and I can fully understand why. Mm. Um, but is there, uh, is there interaction between us? Do we uh, talk? Yeah, about 80% of our, uh, what we do is non-competitive. You know, down to, not relevant now with COVID going on, but yeah. down to, yeah, I want to have a conference in City X, Who's been there? Where do I avoid? Where do I go to? Who's who? Can I use sort of thing? Yeah, and uh, that's very, very often. Yeah, uh, and earlier on, uh, off air, myself and Martin were talking about uh, an organisation called Aegean, which is the European group of networks and alliances, uh, where we meet and there's we talk about what's happening in the profession, what's happening there, and we we do uh, share uh, war stories as well as uh, suggestions and advantages. So. And I don't see that that's not going to stop because, as I say, there's about 80% of the of work we do is the same and it's not competitive. Yeah. There are, uh, then you've got the 20%. That's, that's the bit that has the competitive edge and that's the bit that doesn't get necessarily. Sure. Martin, are you getting all kinds of offers to, to buy you or merge with you or buy in others? Well, uh, mergers are often out there. Are people inquiring about the prospect? But I think we're a well-established and uh, long-lasting association, and our members joined our organisation distinctly to be a part of that. I don't see a huge appetite for them changing that. They like the culture, and that, I think that's true of many of these associations. Some are in a position where their size would uh, benefit considerably from a merger, give some economy of scale. But those economies, when you're at a, a, a sort of a billion dollar kind of turnover organization, aren't sufficient. The costs aren't really what drive the organization. The culture and the people are really at the heart of it. Yeah. But I, I would just go on to endorse what Graham was saying about us being collaborative and not competitive. We really only compete, if at all, at the margins, which is when we're looking for new member firms in a particular jurisdiction. But most of the associations, networks, uh, certainly the ones I deal with, are well established in the major economies in London, New York, Paris, Berlin, or wherever we might be talking about. And uh, so we're, we're really not fighting in any respect. We've got a lot more to gain from collaborating with each other than we have to lose from uh, from from doing that. So. Absolutely. Uh, James, Julio, anything to add to that? Uh, not really. I mean, I think just to uh, look at it from a slightly different perspective, the collaboration really started, in fact, um, one of Martin's predecessors in 2000, a chap called Simon Fraser, was told by his chairman, look, it's a bit of a lonely world being one or two people running a small network. Why don't you get together? And Simon, who I knew on a personal basis, rang me up and said, look, James, let's get together. And the group that is now the London Executives met, I suspect, sort of late 2000 for the first time. And there were four or five of us. And that group has now grown and grown. Uh, Aegean... Uh, was born out of another group run by um, a chap called Jerome Adam, who, who set that up probably um, in the late 90s. So there has always been collaboration. It's, it's useful, as, as, as Graham says, in terms of just getting info about a, a place where you might want to run a meeting and so on. Um, a lot of sharing of resources, because, uh, you know, if you have a member in some relatively remote part of the world, um, if I don't have a member there, I'd much rather go to Martin and say, have you got somebody in, in such and such a place and know that they were tried and tested, albeit by technically a competitor, rather than having to Google and find a strange firm. Yeah. So I don't think that uh, the current situation has necessarily changed levels of cooperation and collaboration particularly. Um, I think this, this question about M&A activity is interesting. Um, Julio mentioned um, an acquisition that uh, he's hoping to conclude very shortly. I, I think he will. Uh, that was pre-COVID, so that was nothing to do with COVID. But I think that one or two, well, a, a number of, particularly the smaller groups, are struggling. 
because the smaller groups tend to have smaller firms as members. Uh, firms that are inevitably dealing with smaller clients locally, they're the sorts of firms that are going to lose some of their client base. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you're running a, a smaller association, maybe 70, 100 firms, and all of a sudden, some of those smaller members are going to turn around to you and say, I'm really sorry, we're conserving cash, we've got to prioritize, and much as we enjoy our membership, we can't prioritize. And so we are seeing a number of people talking to us at the moment saying, look, we haven't got there yet. Um, I think the crunch will come probably in January and February next year. Most of the groups have December year ends. So most have collected their, their membership dues if they were well run in January or February this year before it all kicked off. Yeah. Um, I think there is a degree of optimism maybe a degree of naive optimism about the strength of the organization and the crunch will come you know when people send out their bills in december to collect in january and february that is when people will you know will begin to see what's really going on yeah sure thank you for that julio anything you wanted to add to that you're living this at the moment <laughs> <clears throat> yeah i mean um, I, I, I agree in, in most parts with the collaboration uh, uh, aspect of uh, networks and associations. I mean, even, uh, you know, 18 years back when I first started, uh, there was a group in, in the U.S. called the AFEDS. Um, and I went to one of the first London executives meeting uh, at one of our members firm member firms in London back in the day called little John Frazier. And this was like, uh, when you guys first started. So, um, it's always been a, a collaboration, uh, spirit, not always a hundred percent, uh, collaboration by every association. I tend to disagree with the, uh, with the com competition, uh, comments made by my friends on the call. Uh, I do think competition is fierce. Uh, when it comes to networks, especially when you don't have a firm in a location uh, where you're looking to bring in a member. I think it's easy to say that competition doesn't exist in a place like maybe London or New York uh, because you may have members there, you may have three members there. Uh, but say, uh, you know, a, a location in the U.S. specifically, which happens to be a very difficult market to, uh, to develop, uh, competition, competition is very fierce. And as a matter of fact, I see time and time again uh, networks picking off firms from other networks and associations picking off firms from other associations because the number of quality firms is limited. So um, I disagree uh, with, with that sentiment. I think it's friendly. Comp it's, it's, it, it can be a lot of times friendly competition. I've gotten uh, referrals from other associations as well. So I don't want to say it's, it's just uh, this, you know, uh, a bad atmosphere, but there's definitely competition between groups. Yeah. Um, I think we're each trying to stand out as associations or networks and prove uh, to quality and good active uh, firms uh, that we can provide what they, what they need. Um, we're, we're, we are a, not a club, uh, we're a business network. Uh, and that's what we, we try to promote as abacus worldwide. Um, so we are looking for these aggressive firms and we're pretty aggressive when we try to, to reach out to the right firms and the right markets to bring them on to help us have a very valuable network for our members. Now, when it comes to mergers, um, as I mentioned before, I'm definitely not afraid of mergers. Um, I, I, when I was with Polaris, uh, I merged that group, uh, being, you know, uh, you know, 12 years ago, almost, uh, when that process started. So I was a little younger, a little more naive uh, than, than I am now, not to say I'm uh, much more wise, but just a little bit more. Um, and, and actually that was part of the process that created a very large, very strong organization that you, that you know today uh, around the world. Uh, and pre that, uh, pre the Polaris IGAF, which created uh, Prime Global, I was part of the uh, IA Polaris, which is what, what created the Polaris. So I've gone through three mergers now, uh, counting this one coming up with, with JHI. Um, and ultimately, I think, it, I think we're going to see some more of that. Uh, I agree with James sentiment, uh, I, 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 mainly on the, on the smaller side of the association world. I, th I think COVID uh, will have an impact on all associations. Uh, I think not just the smaller associations, 
but very much so the longstanding uh, associations, the associations that have a list of 20 or 30 in-person meetings around the world. There is going to be a major shift on how associations and networks uh, bring value to their members. Uh, the value has, has been very, very, very much so on meeting in person. Uh, there's other things, but that's been a big value. And to go from a, a 20, 30 program uh, network to now, how do we get together? How do we do this? There's going to be a shift. So I think some of that is going to open up uh, questions on value, what firms are paying versus what firms are receiving. Uh, that may end up in losing some members. It may up, end up in gaining some members. Uh, and I think there may be opportunity for some of these groups to look and say, hey, how can we better serve our members? And as a merger, uh, or coming together with another group and option. I think, I think we may see some more of that. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, it was a, a question I didn't plan to ask, but there's some really interesting insights there. So we've got five topics, fellas, if you can keep your answers as short as possible, hopefully we can get through them. And let's start with the response. And uh, Martin, let me start with you on this one. How have your firms coped generally with what's going on right now? And, and, and how have you supported them? What have the good ones done well and how have you helped? Uh, the vast majority of our member firms were pretty well placed in terms of cloud accounting. So that has enabled them to continue to deliver services to their clients by using the technology that's available to them. Obviously, a very rapid uh, lockdown in some jurisdictions has been really challenging. But most have adapted pretty quickly and pretty well. Uh, they, uh, there were initial concerns about the, uh, the economic impact and how quickly that would manifest itself. It turns out that our firms have been busier than ever in providing first aid to their clients. Mm. Um, they, the tendency has been perhaps to more domestic focus. I think the international investments and M&A activity has slowed. It hasn't stopped, but it's slowed. Uh, but They've responded, I, I would say, well, very few have lost people, have needed to shed jobs. They've kept them because they're very busy and they've kept their clients. And on the whole, their clients are paying. I think it's most difficult in uh, countries where the economic conditions were already weak and poor. So mm -hmm. in parts of Central America, especially parts of uh, Africa, that's where it's the most difficult circumstances where there's uh, been a <clears throat> lockdown for uh, the, the uh, whole economy, but there's been no government support because the governments have no money. And there's been additional legislation uh, forcing private companies to continue to hire everybody, not giving any opportunity for the private companies to, to lay anyone off. So they, then uh, uh, that part of the business is in very difficult uh, situations. But those are fairly limited in terms of the, the parts of the world where that's really impacting deep. Most yeah. economies that have been uh, well supported for now, but that does mean the consequences might be very long lasting. Yeah. James, how have you seen firms cope and how have they leaned into your organization? Well, we tend not to deal directly <clears throat> with individual firms. We tend to deal with the networks and the associations. Um, having said that, I have spoken to a number of firms. I think Martin made an interesting point. Um, his firms have been very busy and he described it as first aid. Um, and that's, I think there is a huge difference between being busy uh, doing first aid um, and doing sort of valuable long term work. Um, I think, you know, accountants don't expect to get paid very quickly. You know, they're often working on 60 or 90 days. And if you're a small manufacturing business in a country which has a, a difficult economy, you're probably going to pay your suppliers of raw materials faster than you're going to pay your accountant. And I think just as I said earlier on about the crunch time for the networks and associations coming in January or February, when members are going to renew, I think there will be some firms who have perhaps taken reassurance in terms of the hours they've clocked up on their timesheets over the last couple of months. I think it'd be very interesting to see how they are feeling two or three months down the track when they have or maybe have not collected uh, the money due to them. And yeah. I think that's, uh, I don't know the answer, but I think there is, uh, there are one or two shocks around the corner. Well, keep your powder dry because we are going to talk about the future a little bit later on. Uh, Julio, what have you seen in how your firms have coped and how have you supported them? 
You know, it's a similar uh, experience from, from what Martin mentioned. I mean, I, I think at least what we're seeing, um, again, firms are busy. That's what we're getting from everyone. Um, I, I think a lot depends on the types of clients the firms have uh, and the part of the world that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think our most affected regions are, are more of the developing nations. Uh, I think those are the ones that probably are going to have a little bit more difficult time, not because of the way they're structured. Most of our firms are, are set up virtually, set up with cloud uh, services. Uh, so they, they have the capabilities of working and continuing to work with their clients. But a lot mm. of times it depends on the clients that they're working with. Uh, and some developing nations are a little more difficult to uh, really work with clients virtually if they're not set up virtually. So um, I also think it creates opportunities. And I know we're going to talk about that later. So I, I would like to talk about that part when it comes up. So I'll put that aside. Uh, but what we are seeing is that firms are using this as an opportunity to be what they always say they are, which is the trusted advisor. Yeah. And And I think we can't uh, um, lose focus on that. I agree, James. What, uh, James comment that the question is when, when, and and how much of the work is going to be collectible uh, or collected, and and when that happens, and when that build work is going to actually come in, um, because the billings are are continuing. I mean, if firms are doing work, uh, but I think if if the firms look at this as almost like a goodwill, this is this is what we are here for. Um, you know, anything having to do with regulatory changes, tax changes, uh, this type of loan application that we have going on in uh, the U.S. and the U.K. and different parts of, of, of the world that are, are funding, uh, uh, government fundings, um, all of that usually uh, means a benefit for member firms in the accounting and legal industry because it means that their clients are going to ask them, "Hey, how do we do this? Uh, can you help us out?" Yeah. So um, we're we're seeing we're seeing that we're also still seeing. Uh, I know Martin Martin mentioned the international. Uh, it hasn't really dropped off for us. It's been steady, uh, at least what we're seeing. Um, it really has not been a change in the number of referrals that have been going out on a monthly basis since COVID. Uh, so that's interesting to see. I think there are uh, there might be a, a big increase in the need to refer business overseas and, and to different parts of the world uh, internationally. I think mostly uh, there's gonna be opportunities um, where there is uh, you know, no restrictions like in Australia right now, they're restricting any inbound investment, but many countries aren't. Yeah. So I think there's gonna be opportunity from the Asian uh, region from uh, you know, uh, in investment coming inbound. Um, and we're seeing a little bit of that throughout the network right now. So I think as we grow there, there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, opportunity there. Yeah. As you said, we're, we're going to come on to opportunities. Graham, you were looking really thoughtful there. I saw your fingers like this. This, this is not a time to, for firms to be isolated, is it? They need to lean into a, a network, and association, a tribe, if you like. How have you seen them cope and how have you helped? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, to the point that, that Martin made, um, if you're looking at audit and you're looking at tax, the all my firms are 20 yeah they're, they're working full out yeah yes a certain amount of the tax work is uh, first aid the area where uh we have had f people furloughed and looked at furloughs is in the management consulting area and to a certain extent the transaction services m a uh be, but uh, i mean we'll come on to the future uh, as julio quite rightly pointed that's, uh, I think that's a transitory uh, area. Uh, where I think the, the firms have uh, really benefited, my, my firms have really worked well by leaning, to your point, Rob, of leaning in, is by making sure that they became uh, really expert in all the things and Julio hit it on the nose. Mm -hmm. you know, they've been quoting themselves as your trusted advisor uh, to all their clients for the last x years in fact it used to be one of our uh one of our mantras one of our uh, strap lines which we dropped but you know tr they've been quoting that now they they've got to prove that they are what they said they are and to that extent they've got to know everything from the inside out of the cares act in the us to the uh covid act here in the uk to you know the ones they've got in spain and italy and and even the ones in zimbabwe etc 
so if they did, they really got to get to know these, uh, what is available, what can be done, what should be done, and to be there for their clients. I mean, the one thing I think, um, everyone's talking about the new norm, and I know we're coming on to that in a second, but I think we're in a state today, uh, the, the status quo today is not the status quo nine months ago. Uh, it's more, it's closer to whatever the status quo will be going forward. Um, I mean, we just talk about, uh, Martin mentioned briefly, travel. Um, we've, we've cut our travel budget. Everyone's cut their travel budget. Okay, there's a certain amount of travel has been cancelled because of COVID. But people have now, uh, old crumblies like myself, uh, yeah, have suddenly realised that, you know what? Zoom actually works and works well. And, yeah, we, we can carry on. I mean, I've, I've been using uh, an equivalent thereof for some time. But now like I suspect the other members of, of the team here, I'm probably on an average of four to five hours a day of Zoom calls, uh, whether it's with my team who are all working remotely, my, my head office team uh, who all work remotely, or whether it's with uh, particular managing partners or, or people with needs from around the world. Yeah. And it's, it's fine. Now, we will, continue, we will have, as soon as we're allowed, face-to-face -face meetings, nothing's going to replace those, but I think Julio mentioned it, but yeah, we might have three or four such face-to-face -face a year, not eight or nine as we had in the past. Yeah. And frankly, we'll, we will have probably the equivalent of 20 or 30 meetings via Zoom rather than the eight or nine that we would have had in person. And we, therefore, the, the connectivity and the communications uh, will, uh, will increase. And communications at the moment is the one thing I've noticed has really taken off. The real communication, real commu uh, talking to people. Engagement. Real face-to-face -face yeah. engagement, absolutely. Okay, well, I can see you all itching to get into the opportunities, and I sense a very bullish, positive nature about this. And James, we are talking about recovery now. We are talking about replacing lost revenues, lost clients, filling depleted pipelines. So where will accounting firms, in your opinion, find opportunities for growth and recovery out of this? Well, there's, there's no doubt that there are opportunities there. Um, but th there are going to be some, some firms, some businesses falling away. There's also no question about that. So I think that uh, where there are opportunities, it's going to require firms to look at themselves very carefully, to look at their client base very carefully, and to just take a deep hard look about how they need to be structured to capitalize on those opportunities. You can't carry dead wood. Mm. I think that uh, you're going to find that um, there will be changes. There will be people and clients leaving firms. You will see firms um, getting together to, to, to uh, just enjoy the economies of scale and share resources. I think the real danger is the firm that says, phew, we survived now we can get back to normal because there won't, I mean, I, I think the, the phrase new normal is, is hugely overused and misunderstood. I don't even know what the new normal is. All we know is it's going to be significantly different from what we've had in the past. And the stories that you hear of, of one or two perhaps more senior uh, managing partners saying, you know, well, we're going to get them back into the office next week and that'll be great. Um, we'll get back to normal, don't worry are living in, in, in cloud cuckoo land. It is going to be fundamentally different. And I think that people have got to uh, look at the broader picture in order to capitalize on those opportunities. It's not just a matter of saying that this is our firm. Here are the clients that we serve. Here are the clients that we would like to serve. You've actually got to say, you know, what does the market look like? Where are the opportunities? How do we structure ourselves in order to capitalize on those opportunities? And um, I think when we spoke last time, Rob, we talked about the sort of the three stages of disaster recovery. And everybody's been very good at one and two. You know, we've coped with the crisis, we're managing the crisis, but not every firm has yet got their head around what they need to be doing to capitalize on the future. Yeah. Martin, where would, would you see the opportunities over the next few months for accounting mm -hmm. firms? I'd agree with James to the extent that it's going to be market driven. So you need to see what the market will require and then establish the services rather than decide what services you deliver and trying to find people that will uh, will 
uh, demand those. You need but to is that them. quite a reactive approach, Martin? Just waiting and seeing, or? Oh no, anticipating what those services are likely to be. But it will be market driven. I think that's what we're suggesting. Is not uh, ju not just the traditional lines, but it. Is, and I think expansion of services into areas and and technology has been a clear. Uh, leader in the way in which this is working and technology security for instance is an area in which accounting firms are well placed to provide a broader range of professional services that will include that kind of service uh, so there there is uh, instantly one area there's also opportunities within the marketplace as James said it's likely that some firms will no longer find themselves in business so there's going to be opportunities there <clears throat> and I think quite a few of the, uh, the uh, intermediate, I would say, the, the multinational players will review who is right for providing the support to them. So there may be some, there may have been a little bit, of, I don't know, it might be called hubris in some firms saying, oh, we need to have one of the big four accounting firms, for example, to do our audit. And actually they might reevaluate that and find, you know what, we need actually a firm that's better tailored to our size of business uh, and understands us better rather than one of the glo big global multinationals. So, you know, I don't see those big multinational uh, entities moving into uh, into the mid-tier, but I do see those uh, firms that would probably be better placed in the mid-tier re-evaluating and finding themselves moved back there. Mm. Graham, what do you think? Is there going to be more M&A activity to grow firms out of this or more advisory or more international stuff? There's a lot of areas where firms <laughs> can recover, isn't there? There is, but I mean, Martin and, and um, James hit it on, on the head. Um, it's not going to be the old norm. No. Um, the, uh, in fact, I've, one of my other things, uh, like James, I don't like the new norm. It's really the new new. And we, we know some of it. We don't know the rest of it. Yeah, uh, I could do uh, a Mr. Rem uh, what's it? Mr. Rumsfeld thing. It's the unknown unknowns coming right at us. And um, it, it's going to be like that. But the, yeah, yes, uh, within the uh, profession, there will be those who try to go back to the old norm and they won't survive. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, and th but those who are preparing and looking at how to go forward, to use technology, as Martin said, to use the, the situation now, uh, to uh, say, use different uh, aspects uh, and to use their staff and their uh, their major resource of their personnel uh, differently and have probably a different mix of personnel. Yes, you'll need the technology guys, but that was already happening. But then, uh, you know, people have now worked at home in the UK and, and in the US in particular and Western Europe. Uh, people in, in the firms have worked successfully at home for 12, 15 weeks and generated, you know, generated income, continue generating income. Now, most of them, I suspect, will want at some stage to go back to actually be in, a, um, in an office at times, because the, you know, meeting around the water cooler or the coffee machine or the donuts, depending on wh where you particularly are, uh, and having um, just that social side of things, is going to be still important, but I don't see um, the, uh, the constant going back and then everyone being in their locality, etc. cetera. Uh, I mean, I was talking to a, a German firm just before we came on air uh, and they're all back and they said, well, we've got our partners back and we've got our own offices, so we're, we're isolated, etc." And most of our staff, I said, well, you know, when we go back, we'll be going back in 20%. Uh, and I know in the London, you know, this is outside of our profession, but if you look at Rathbones and um, some of the big legal firms and Casanova and all that sort of thing, in the city of London, they, their plans are all that they will actually only have 20%, between 20 and 30% of their staff in the office at any one time. Uh, and I can see that, you know, and there you start to see the, the physical footprint and therefore the cost the second biggest cost for most firms, it, it can be, be saved, that's fine. Then you get your people out actually communicating via things like Zoom with their clients directly. So the clients, you know, the clients have got used to seeing their, uh, their trusted advisor uh, regularly, maybe 
weekly or monthly rather than turning up once a year just before the audit and then disappearing off immediately after the audit. Yeah. So I think you know, all people who are going to be the most successful are those who are looking at where we are now and as Martin said, working out what might work in the future, how they would then that happen. And yes, there's a certain reactiveness to it, to your question, Rob, because we will see how things go, but it's keeping your eye on that ball and keeping going. They are the people who are going to, those are the firms that are really going to be successful. Sure. And I'm going to ask you gentlemen in a moment to get your crystal ball out and try to map out the next 6, 12, 24 months. But uh, Julio, just to finish with you on this, we are going to get casualties, but on the whole, it's a good time to be an accounting, a law firm, isn't it? I think it is. I mean, like I said, any kind of regulatory changes and, and shifts in uh, uh, financial you know, models and, and, and uh, government funding, it, it's all good for our, our members, essentially. I mean, no one likes to say it's good, but, but it turns out to create more work and more opportunity. Um, I think M&A uh, is going to see, you know, increased activity, corporate finance. Uh, it's just going to happen. I mean, there's going to be, if you, if, again, a lot depends on the clients you're working with. Uh, but if you have clients that were, you know, having a difficult time, financially speaking, they will probably be looking at closing their business, selling their business, whatever I mean, it may solvency be. Solvency is going to be a big solvency growth. Solvency is yeah. going to be a huge. So this is not something that we have to wait for the market. We know this. I mean, uh, but I, I do agree. There are some things that you, the market will, will show itself. But another one I, I think is, is, is huge opportunity is technology. I mean, our firms uh, are constantly talking about cloud and, you know, virtual this and virtual that, and we don't have any paper, paperless and all this other wonderful things. Now is an opportunity that these firms can use this knowledge as uh, turning around and, and providing it as a service to clients that maybe aren't there yet. Um, and if you're not doing that and you're not thinking about that, if you weren't doing that and thinking about that, you know, six months ago, a year ago, uh, you better be thinking about it now because it's definitely an opportunity. Mm. Um, so I think technology is a big one. I think uh, as, as uh, it was mentioned just a minute ago, uh, uh, we have, uh, sorry, uh, we have an opportunity within the firms to take uh, our members to take their firm a step further in technology. Um, this COVID, you know, virtual meeting uh, frenzy is what I call it. Uh, everybody now is on Zoom and, you know, six months ago, some people didn't even know what Zoom was. Um, I personally use, we use a different platform to be honest with you, but pre COVID this, this has always been part of, uh, the advocacy strategy, which is virtual offerings versus in-person and in-person is very valuable and very important. But we but proved I, we can do this now, haven't we, Julio? That's we the point. Proved, well, I, I think what happens is, uh, if you were if you were on the fence about this, you're you're pushed over the edge yeah. because of COVID. So if your firm was considering, you know, remote work, and you were already considering this as part of your strategy, this just pushed you over the limit, and now you're not going back. Now, if your firm uh, is nowhere near was nowhere near thinking about this, and you've been forced to take this on, those are the folks that I I hate to say it, but like James said we're going back to normal. And, yeah. and that, that normal is not coming back. Um, I think those, those firms are not going to succeed and, and they're just going to be seen as, as you know, not, not moving forward with what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think this, this thing has pointed definitely to, to a shift, uh, culturally speaking, on, on what's acceptable with meetings, uh, with communication, uh, with getting in front of people and, and, and even the sales process. Uh, you know, how, how it's handled. I'm not taking away value from in-person meetings. I think they're hugely valuable. I agree with, uh, with the comments here. I don't, uh, Abacus is not going to do away with our in-person meetings. Absolutely not. There's huge value in that. But uh, we're going to continue to push forward with the strategy we've always had, which is providing this as an opportunity for members to really share. Uh, we've... Have we lost Julio there? Frozen Julio. We've just lost him a little bit. Okay, we'll pick him up, but we'll <laughs> proceed. The joys of technology, but I'm sure they have in the internet in Miami. So um, let's go on and talk about the future, gentlemen. I mean, you've touched on it a little bit with talking about the opportunities, but we do know that 
Uh, loans that have been taken out are going to become payable. We know that tax bills that have been deferred are going to become due. We're in for a recession. We're in for an economic downturn. So, uh, Martin, let's start with you. Let's get your crystal ball out. What is coming up for the next few months, and particularly 2021, which we think might be a little bit tougher than 2020? Well, just before I get into that, I, I would be very hesitant about describing these as good times in any perspective. Some people, very many people have had desperately difficult times. Mm. So whilst there may be work around for you know, plenty of uh, opportunities and work to do for accounting firms, they are part of society and they're integrated with society. And many of them have got very difficult livelihoods. They've got people to look after. Uh, so... Um, I wouldn't by any stretch of the imagination uh, describe them as good times, even if there are business opportunities there. In fact, many are using any opportunities they have to support their clients that are less well placed. And I think there's a great deal of philanthropy out there and goodwill being generated rather than necessarily cash by making sacrifices and, and you make a good point i was i was basically saying that whatever the problems mm -hmm. businesses have right now accountants are probably the answer whether times are tough or good then accountants can deal with that that was well, well i certainly I think they have a valuable role to play but yeah. i wouldn't necessarily uh, i want to describe that as being good times for a, a good time to be an accountant it's a value it's a time at which you can make a valuable contribution and i think that's where we go in the future those that will continue to uh, survive and prosper and make a valuable contribution are those that recognize a changing world, one in which sustainability is a critical factor uh, and diversity is as well. We're seeing many concurrent trends going on at the moment and I think that a reversion to where we were previously, not just from the standpoint of the way business was done, but the way that society operates, we're at a, I think, a really systemic uh, change coming through at all sorts of levels and people need to be attuned to that I think for the future so that that's where I think success will lie it's not just about how much you can take out of the system but actually what are you putting in what's your contribution what good are you doing accounting firms and law firms for that matter bring proprietary to business they deal with things like money laundering they expose that where it applies they can make a really valuable contribution to society and that's a that, that, that's a crucial role for the future I think yeah. Julio, we lost you briefly, but we've just pivoted to the future now. We were saying that recession may be coming and there's going to be some tough times and yeah, there are opportunities, but we're asking the crystal ball question now. What do you feel is coming up for the next 12, 24 months in our world? Yeah, look, it's been a difficult time for everybody. Um, there, there's no doubt uh, about the difficulty of, of what's gone on with COVID. Uh, you know, in the U.S., we have uh, you know other other things that are uh, civil related and, and unrest there, and um, I, I think crisis management in general <laughs> uh, has been a big part of of our firms and, and how firms deal with it and how uh, they address the, you know uh, uh, working with and taking care of their clients and their their staff and everything. So yeah, I, I agree with Mark. Uh, it's it's definitely been a difficult time, but. Um, you know, society has to move forward. And, and it is, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, working really for them, as we were mentioning before, uh, to be part of that, uh, to be part of ushering uh, people into the future as they were before. I think, you know, um, I, I have seen uh, more communication, and we talked about this earlier, from member firms than ever before. And, and they all, I, I remember, you know, getting into these roundtable discussions about, you know, newsletters or articles and things like that. And, you know, some of them did it and some of them didn't. Uh, I, I think now they're at a point where they understand that this, this is valuable. It's helping people. It's not just, it's not just marketing my firm. It's actually getting things, getting things out there. Um, so the future, uh, 20, 2021, uh, for, you know, for Abacus, you know, I mentioned this slightly before, um, the, the strategy that we've always had, and in, in we look at virtual, right? Um, when I, 18 years ago, when I first started, we all had, an, I had an office with staff. That's how we were set up. Um, as, as time progressed, uh, and we went through that merger that I mentioned, um, one of the initiatives I had as the executive director at the time was taking our staff virtual. And that was met with so much resistance, believe it or not, that when we first mentioned it, 
Um, but we did it. We were one of the first associations that took the staff virtual. We had a virtual office, virtual staff, uh, uh, and and that's how you know I got introduced to this prior to Abacus. And when we started Abacus, when I launched Abacus, it was the same concept. And the concept was, look, uh, cost-wise, it makes sense. And future-wise, it makes sense. This is the way things are going to be done in the future. If we're not acting that way now, we're missing the mark. If we're yeah. not aiming towards that now, we're missing the mark. So I think the future is going to look very different for, for most firms. Um, but I think a lot of firms already knew that. Um, so the, the question is, how quickly can you implement the plans that you already had in place? I guarantee all these firms, a majority of them, have plans in place to deal with moving forward technology-wise, moving forward remote work-wise. Um, I think there's going to be opportunities in, in, in the future for uh, a real estate uh, a, a subset of, uh, of service lines because I think there's going to be a lot of empty uh, office buildings <laughs> repurposing of that, how that works. Yeah. Uh, how it doesn't work. So there's going to be opportunities there. Uh, I, th I think future-wise for, uh, for the associations, I, I think you're going to see some consolidation. I do, we, did, we said that at the beginning. I, see, I think you're going to see some consolidation as well at the, at the firm level. Uh, maybe a different type of, of, of consolidation. Maybe it's going to be uh, you know, a firm that isn't that tech savvy, bringing in a firm that has, you know, sure. or joining a firm that has much more technology uh, capabilities because it just complements them. Yeah. So this, this combining of old and new, uh, you know, I think is what we're going to see come out of this. Yeah, thank you. We're struggling a little bit with the sound there, Julio, but we, we've got you. Uh, Graham, what is your crystal ball telling you? Well, first of all, I'm hoping my crystal ball is telling me that I'll, I'll have a barber that's opened at some stage and get a <laughs> bloody haircut. Um, but, but apart from that, I think Martin hit a, a very important point. People have been, um, quite rightly, campaigning for years about the environment, about uh, the particulates in the air, about uh, equality and all the rest of it. Uh, what this... Uh, COVID situation has forced us to see is that it's not silly. These things can happen, do happen, etc. And it's brought an awful lot out. And I think the, uh, the, the old guard that James referred to uh, earlier about those who going back to the old normal are never mind the fact that they're going to find it virtually impossible to do that because their clients won't want it. They're going to find that their staff don't want it. And that their staff, um, particularly those of, shall we say, the next generation to myself, uh, so the, the Julios and, and younger, um, they're going to find that, you know, they're going to say, well, hang on a minute, you know, we could work remotely and we were effective. Uh, and if we did that, the pollution came down. I mean, you see that the pollution index around the world, people could finally see that the um, Mount Everest from, from uh, places, um, Kathmandu and, and uh, I've, I've run marathons in Beijing and suddenly Beijing, you know, is not the fog capital of the world. Mm -hmm. So these are things people are saying, hang on a minute. This is, you know, we don't need to travel everywhere. We don't need this level of thing. And I think that the generation, particularly those generation below us are going to see technology by don't just mean, you know, zoom and, and electronic. I mean, all of the technology we, we've produced, and we've used over this period, been forced to use, regardless of what age you are, I think that is, is the biggest thing uh, that we can say. It's going to force the whole uh, business world going forward, whether it's in, in the accounting profession, the law profession, or you know, in the businesses that we support uh, and our clients going forward. This is going to very, change very much. Yeah. And our, our, the, the people within that are, go, are going to force it, that the employees and i think that of all the um the things martin's absolutely right there's been a terrible terrible uh, event and we've, we've lost whatever it is you know sure. millions of people but um maybe it's taken this crisis for um people to to see what's going forward the, well, the other thing if i can just one last thing quickly yeah i think will uh affect 21 in particular and frankly that's the election in the u.s this november <laughs> Yeah, we'll watch this space for that one. 
Uh, gents, we've lived through crises before. You, you've probably hit a couple of recessions in your time. We learned and jumped back fairly quickly from the last one, 2008-9, but what does the future look like for you? I think this is totally different from 2008. Yeah. Um, what I would like to suggest is one should be really combining the views of Martin and Graham. Uh, I think that we're not looking at um, simply changes in business practice. We're looking at major societal change. I think that people's attitudes have changed. You look at communities. I live in a small community and, and the way that people are pulling together is just quite would have been inconceivable 12 months ago. Yeah. And we're not going to throw that all away. So I think that you'll find that the motivation of people leading firms will change. They won't be driven by, by the drivers that have been common in the past. Uh, I think Graham is right too. Um, staff have suddenly realized, staff and clients, the people who pay for these things, are beginning to realize that actually life can work well remotely. I remember 2000 people saying, why are you traveling? Why can't you just ring them up? Why can't? And I said, oh, no, 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 you've got to have face-to-face -face meetings. And I was wrong, no yeah. question about it. So I think that one really needs to look at society, business's role in society, business's role as employers. All of those things need to be taken together. And I think that the vast majority of people in this world, whether they're in business or any other walk of life, are totally underestimating the long-term impact of this change. Yeah, it's a really good point. Gentlemen, this, we've covered some great topics today. I'm just going to ask for 30 seconds closing remarks in the form of what would you say to the accountants listening? Your war cry, if you like, your call to arms. What would you say to them to give them a little bit of encouragement and hope very, very quickly? We've, we've talked about the, the importance of a virtual world. We've talked about the importance of agility and engagement and collaboration. So, Julia, we'll start with you first. Very, very quickly, I want to finish at the top of the hour. So, your final call to action. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for, for letting uh, or inviting me to the call, Rob. And, and just really my, my comment is really that. Just continue being what uh, you've always said you are, the trusted advisors. I think that's, to me, the biggest thing that we're seeing coming out of our firms. And uh, that's the value that, that we've always said our firms are adding. And I think that's the value that, that we're going to gonna be, that trusted advisor for, for clients and for and your uh, colleagues. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Grant, final thoughts from you? Yeah, uh, I would say to everyone, look at what you've changed. Not, don't consider the fact you've had to change and you've been forced to change, but look at what you've changed and how it's changed you and how you've changed the way you worked and how you could then make that as effective, if not more effective going forward. So, you know, learn from what you're doing. Don't return to the old norm. Yes, and they say it's not going to be a reboot where you turn your computer on and off and, and it comes back to how it was. As you were hinting, James, this is going to be a reset, isn't it? We're coming back to something very different. So what's your final words of encouragement for the accountants watching? Well, I think there are opportunities, but they need to not only cope with the change they're seeing, but they need to anticipate future change. Yeah. And they need to anticipate future change in the context of a totally different society. And if they're prepared to do both those things, then there are real opportunities both to make money, which is often a driver, but to, to really contribute to society as well. And yeah. I think this is actually a really exciting time to be, to be looking at the, at the world generally and the business world in particular yeah. um, from a position of great age. Thank you. And Martin, final thoughts from you. Uh, encouraging words for the accountants watching and listening. I sense before this crisis that there was a growing feeling in uh, generations coming through the system that they wanted to see change. They wanted yeah. to see a different society. They want to see different values. The values that have driven accountants for years, the ethics that underpin the profession, I say this as an outsider, as a non-accountant, are really inspiring in that regard. And I think those are the grounds on which people will build great careers that help build a better, more sustainable, more equal, and less divided society. That's where they need to be going, and I'm sure that's where they will be. Um, that's fantastic. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to let you go on time. I'm sure you've got another call at the top of the hour as we, this is the world we live in. It's a, uh, it's a zoom related world, but uh, we really appreciate your insights today. I've got a dog barking in the background and it just shows you how real this is, but uh, thank you so much for your thoughts. 
I'm going to leave the room open if you just want to talk to each other a little bit, but I'm going to stop the recording now and say thank you for your uh, contribution today. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thank you.